people don't. I mean, there's some parents that don't even go back there, you know. But yeah. They're not sure. It's hard on the ones that do. Are you gloating this morning? No. Not in the gloat about. <laughs> that was, I was. Good morning, and we're so glad that you could join us this morning. I just have a few quick announcements. First of all, I want to introduce myself. Um, I'm Heather. I'm the children's minister here, um, and so we just wanted to say welcome this morning. So just a couple of announcements. Don't forget that tonight is our gingerbread house contest. It starts at 5. Dinner is provided. We will be having chili, so come, um, come and enjoy this time. If you didn't sign up, I do have two extra houses. If a family wants to come and do join us in our gingerbread contest, that would be great. And then on the 14th, we have our Christmas uh, youth Christmas party and our kids' Christmas party starting at 5. The youth is starting at 3.30. Also, this Friday, if you have not heard, there is it called A Very Merry Christmas Tour with New Song and Francesca Battistelli, and it's down at the Civic Center in Pascagoula. If you would like tickets for that, we're going to, um, you can see Vani. We have tickets to give out to um, our, our people who have come here. So, and that's, it's going to be a great time. Um, and there's going to be something extra special this year as well. Next Sunday is our kids' Christmas program. So I would love for you to come out and support our kids. They've been working really hard, and they're really excited to show you what they're um, doing. So that starts at 5, and then afterwards we're having our Christmas goodies fellowship. So just bring your favorite Christmas finger food or whatever to the back, and then we'll, we'll do that right after our program. All right, I don't think there's anything else. So. Hi, guys. My name is Cindy, and I want to remind you all that today will be the last day we'll take our staff love offering. Um, you can give that offering through any of the five ways that you can give, or you can drop it in the box. Uh, in the foyer here. Just make sure you write on your envelope that it's staff love offering so that we'll know it's designated for that reason. All right. Would y'all stand with us as we sing this morning? Heart the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord made in time behold him come offspring of the virgin's womb veiled in flesh the God had seen pleased as men with men to dwell Jesus our Born to give them 
second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hey, I just want to welcome you this morning. My name is Jim. I'm the minister of music here, and I'm just, I love Christmas time, and I love Christmas music, but I really love just being at church and worshiping, and, and I hope you're happy to be here uh, too, whether you're here or online or going to watch it later. We just welcome you this morning. This is amazing grace. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king of all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love Find it in you. 
I choose to lose my life, Lord, and find it in you. This life is an altar where I want to offer my soul, my mind, and strength. Cleansed by your mercy. To live a life worthy of the one who called my name. Jesus be glorified, Jesus be magnified. Let me be a pleasing sacrifice. Jesus be glorified, Jesus be magnified. altar my life is an offering how could I not love you you offered my rescue you raised me up from death to life your spirit is Let me be a pleasing sacrifice. Jesus be glorified. Jesus be magnified. Here at the altar, my life is in all glory. I choose to lose my life, Lord, and find it in you. I choose to lose my life, Lord, and find it in you. I choose to lose my life, Lord, and find it in you. I choose to lose my life, Lord, and find it in you. called me out upon the water, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in the oceans deep, my faith will stand. I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours and you are mine. Oh, Let me walk the 
We just pray that you would just take us to a place that maybe we've never been before spiritually, emotionally, relationally. God, we want to we want to go deeper. We don't want to stay. I don't want to stay the same because everything else is changing and 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 moving forward. And if I'm staying the same, then I'm actually going backwards because everything else is going forward. But I want to stay the same, and I just can't. And that's the. The whole crux of the song is, God, that you would take us deeper, that you would take us farther than we've ever been before. And, God, that in those deep waters, when those oceans are rising, that we can be still and know that you're God. That somehow in the midst of all the chaos and the catastrophe... We can still see you. We can hear your voice. It may be faint. It may be so faint we can barely hear it, but we hear it. Because we know your voice. You're our shepherd. And our shepherd is calling in the midst of that. So, God, I pray that you would just take us to a place we've never been before. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. When J.D. was born, after eight years of battling and struggling and trying he finally he finally got here but when he got here his mother Casey had really really bad high blood pressure her feet were swollen up and of course in that time the devil's like see I told you I was gonna get you you know those type statements um, that try to make you doubt. So anyway, our doctor happened to be out of town at this time. So our doctor's not coming. Okay. Casey has high blood pressure, have to go to the hospital. And they said, um, we can either induce you or we can do a C-section, but this baby's got to come. And that was a couple of weeks early. So of course it's very, very frightening and we decided, obviously, to do the C-section, and we said, could we do it the next morning? And that, it was in the middle of COVID, the COVID pandemic, June of 2020, so it's already crazy. We can't have any friends or family there. Her mom drives down the next morning to be there in the surgery. Um, a different doctor is performing the procedure, so I'm all kinds of just, you know, that night um, after... They said that they're going to do the surgery. I uh, I remember calling my dad and saying, "Dad, I I just can't like I'd never had so much pressure that I didn't think I could handle." And um, somehow God gave me the strength. Well, the next morning, of course, every everything happens and the surgery happens. Well, then all of a sudden, um, not only is Casey's blood pressure super high. Um, but when J.D. was born, he was, like, wheezing. It was really, really bad. He was struggling to, like, breathe and stuff. And so they had to put him in the ICU. And so I'm thinking, okay, we're going through, you know, all this. And now Casey, hopefully, you know, she'll be all right. And J.D., hopefully he'll be all right. And I didn't know what was going to happen, what was going on. And so Casey's 
has to get cut open on all kinds of medicine, got high blood pressure. The medicine they gave her makes her completely just out of it. Just she's out of her mind. I mean, it was really, really bad. Not only that, but she couldn't hold her baby for 36 hours. And so I remember going to the ICU because I would go and and sit with him. And he had tubes coming out of everywhere. And for some reason, this song, Joseph's Lullaby, came to my mind. That and the song Still, that's why I put these together. And for some reason, I was singing this to my son, and God was singing the song Still to me in the midst of that time, somehow giving me peace in the midst of really, really difficult times and tragedy. And then I think back to Joseph, because uh, like Mercy Me, who wrote this song, said, a lot of songs are about Mary, but think about Joseph. It's already enough responsibility having a child. Try having the Savior of the world as your child. And so Mercy Me wrote this song, which ministered to me in a difficult time for me. And they wrote this song from Joseph's perspective. So. Only imagine. I can only imagine. 
imagine when that day he comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine yeah surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence to my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak it all, I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine, yeah, 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 surrounded by your glory, what we my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence to my knees will I fall will I sing hallelujah will I be able to speak it all I can only I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine, who yeah, I can only imagine, hide me now, unto
All right, we're going to go ahead and let our kiddos come down and go out with Miss Heather. What beautiful children. It's always special to see them in front of us. Where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says He's right here in our midst. And, you know, as we're in the middle of the Christmas season and thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ, we also look at the world around us and recognize just how broken it is. And we continue in Ephesians this morning, so if you have your Bibles, please uh, turn in them or go to them, to Ephesians chapter 6 is where we'll be. Give you a quick overview. We've been moving through this. The whole message of the book is about grace and peace. In fact, the first uh, chapter, second verse, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's come to give us that grace and peace in the midst of a world that's upside down and broken. The beginning of the book, God asked, Paul prays to God to to ask him to open our eyes to see. And and that's really the story of Christmas too, is is that's what coming of Christ meant, was a whole new kingdom, a new life, a new family, all of these things. And to open our eyes to see the work of Christ should be all of our prayers, uh, not just the Christmas season, but every season. In opening our eyes, he's asking us to see the hope that is in Christ, the uh, unimaginable riches that Jesus gives us, and the greatness of God's power. We live in a day and age where so many people feel powerless, powerless to change, powerless to see anything else, in, not only in their own lives, but in the systems around us change. But Paul prays throughout this book of Ephesians, and the Bible teaches throughout it, to, to have God open our eyes to see just how great He is and how good He is. In fact, God is good all the time. Even on a foggy December day, right? He's so good. So in opening our eyes, we start to see the the world the way it really is. Why did Jesus come? Is because the world was dead. We saw doubly dead, not only dead in our sin and our relationship with God, broken because of our own inhumanity and the wrong things we've done, but the broken relationships between one another. Certainly as we move into the holiday season, uh, so many families, if not every family, there's relationships that are broken, that, and all of those come, come up at, at the holidays, don't they? You think about the broken relationships between parents and children, between siblings, between uh, co-workers, all of these things. And you know what? God is all the, very much aware. That's what sin does. It breaks relationships. So we were doubly dead, and here's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only did he come to reconcile us to God, it's through him that we can be reconciled to one another. Becoming doubly alive, reconciled, and then gifted, we learn in Ephesians. We've been given the gift of Christ, and we're in the gift-giving season, right? We've been taught since we were a little bitty that it's better to give than what? Receive. God gave us Christ. So we can be reconciled and become alive to him, to each other. But then he invited us to be part of that gift-giving blessing. To become part of the mission of Jesus. You see, to celebrate Christmas is to recognize Christ and, and to recognize that we are part of his mission. A part of being with Jesus is to share the good news of Jesus. And here's the especially good news. We don't do that on our own power. If you've ever tried to change without the help, without God's power, you know just how hopeless it is. Now, the world's full of hopelessness. Think about the wars raging in Ukraine. New reports even this week. Seems like every week there's somebody killed along the coast here, murdered by another human being. And we can start to think maybe there's not enough power to change it. But oh, when God opens our eyes and we see the infinite power that he comes and brings to act on our behalf. 
this is the message. And so we, we see a whole new life. And, and then we have this structure. And where do we live this new life? We live it in community with one another in the church. He taught us one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He speaks of the unity that we have to have. That's what brings us together here at Temple is we have a common faith in Jesus Christ. We have a common Lord. Lord means boss. We'll talk about that more. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's a public sign when we fill those waters and somebody says, I believe in Jesus, and we use the language, buried with Christ in death and raised to walk in newness of life. Christmas is a great time to think about baptism too, isn't it? One baptism. So we have that peace. And then we have purity, he taught us, in the church. And here's purity at the heart of it. We can have all sorts of adjectives for sins. But the heart of sin is selfishness. You're wanting to consume somebody else to meet your needs. That's idolatry. That's sin. Trying to meet your need and find fulfillment in a person. We were all created to find fulfillment and to find out who we are only in relationship with Jesus Christ and worship of Him. Purity in the church. This works itself out. and Here's where the nuts and bolts we got to in Ephesians, where we live, work, and play. The world around us is dark, and, and how do we live in a world that is dark and broken? We often struggle with this idea of living in a world that's dark and broken when we hear the message of Christ and say, well, doesn't that he say he's going to make everything right and whole? And yes, he does. He does it in a new community. This is part of the beauty of the gospel. In the midst of all the brokenness, in the midst of an upside-down world, he gives us a new kingdom, a new family, a new citizenship, new reborn relationships, not only with him, but with each other. And he shows us and empowers us on how to live in spite of the broken world, to have a different life. The first relationship we looked at was a husband and wife, if you recall, right at the end of chapter 5, first part of 6. And the Bible gives us an image of what it means to live a this life we've been talking about, this new life, abundant life, is a spirit-filled life, gives us an image of being submitted to God and submitted to one another. The Scriptures teach us to think better of others than we do of ourselves, and how contrary that is to the message of the world, isn't it? And we found that at the very heart of marriage. We, we are created, each one of us, male and female, in the image of God. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, the Scriptures tell us. And we're made differently, male and female. We have equal worth, equal value to God, and we're supposed to have to one another. We have different roles. We function differently. We even think differently, male and female, don't we? Anyone that's married knows men and women don't think alike. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And then last week we looked at what, what does family look like right side up? Upside down families are broken families where we prey upon one another. We, meet, we, we use people to meet our needs. We talked about the broken system of the world in families where uh, in the time of Rome when this was written, uh, males dominated everything. You know, they had the right to put their, their wives and children to death just pretty much on a whim to the other extreme of our current world where we say just we don't even really raise our kids, just let them grow up, keep them fed, and, and, and let the schools and other things, fig, let them figure out who they are, what they are, don't provide them any instruction. In the right side up world of, of Jesus, we raise them in the nurture of the Lord, we teach them to love the Lord, and we give them instruction about the Lord in those families. And then we are going to look today at another one at work. But I want to set again the context, because when we're dealing with such a big book, if you go back to chapter 5, verse, verse 18, I'm going to start in the second half of that verse. It said, but be filled by the Spirit. Spirit-filled living is what we've been talking about. Again, I want you to hear that again. What does it mean to live a Spirit-filled life? Who wants to live a Spirit-filled life? I think all of us do that know Christ, right? We, we hear this word a lot. And there's been a lot of different ways it's been talked about. I love this passage in Ephesians because the, the Bible's given us clear instruction about how to live a spirit-filled life within the relationships 
that we have in the real world, right? I mean, this is stuff about where you and I live. This isn't the big cosmic. This is about, okay, how do I live as a husband and wife? How do I live as, as parents and children? And now we're going to be looking at work. And so this whole big circle is the spirit-filled life. And what he said as he went on, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So speaking and then singing and making music like we did this morning uh, with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father. In verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So that big circle is all those things I just talked about. And, and I wanted to set this before we start talking about work because we don't often think about work as worship, do we? When's the last time you thought about going to work as an act of worship. Not too often, right? Have you thought about the relationship between you and Jesus and between you and your boss, or if you're the employer, you and your employees and your relationship with Jesus? You see, the Spirit-filled life for a Christian encompasses all of these relationships, right? We're whole people. For a very long time, we, we always wanted to separate our work life from what? Our family life from our recreation. Last time I checked that we're whole people. I can't let part of me go somewhere and not leave and leave the rest of me behind. We're all there. So marriage and, and work and family all fit within this big set. In other words, marriage, work, family are subsets of the whole spirit-filled life. You're a whole person. So think about that in work now. Here's what he says about work in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way, without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of this word. Lord Jesus, we ask that your spirit fill us, instruct us. Lord, as the scripture says, we ask your spirit to illuminate these words so that we might truly understand them and see the hope and the riches and the inheritance and the infinite power that are present in these words for us, Lord for our good, not for our harm. And Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to work in every area of our lives, every nook and cranny, to show us where we need to let your power work in us, to show us where we need the blood of Christ to cleanse us, Lord, where we need new life. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'd sum up this whole passage first as we all work for Jesus, this section we're looking at. That's a really important concept, isn't it? That we work for Jesus. Now, that's already a, a bit upside down from the way the world is, isn't it? To say that we work for Jesus. There's a handful of things. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home and a Christian heritage. And there was two things that my family and, and my father, my mother, my grandfather, that just stuck with me. One was you always give back to the Lord. I mean, from the time I made my first dollar, I would give a portion of that to the Lord. Always. Just, I never thought about it. It's, you, you know the things you learn that you never question? That, that's one. The other was that, all, that when I work, I work for the Lord. Whatever I do, reflects upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So my, my parents, my grandparents, they instilled a work ethic in me that said, okay, when I go to work, I'm not working for that person. I'm working for the Lord. So the quality of the work I do needs to be the same quality I'd want to present to Jesus. This is, as I said, when something's instilled in you that deep, you never question it. And here's one of the other th things, you, you have an assumption that everybody else thinks that way too. Well, as I got, became a young adult and became an officer in the Navy, did you know I discovered not everybody thinks that the quality of they work, their work should be the same quality they'd give to God? That might even be some of you here or listening on the Internet, that you, you're, the quality of the work that you do 
and the flip side, the quality of the employer you are, you don't think that that's what God asked. But notice this passage is very plain, is it not? Everything we do, we do for the Lord. I want us first to look at the system because there's some hard words in this passage. It, master, slave, slavery, and over the centuries since Christ, there have been human beings that try to use this passage to say that, see, God supports slavery. Absolutely not. Remember the context of this. He's telling us how to work within a system that is broken. And in this passage, he then says, here is this broken system, master, slave, because that's what happened then. That, that was the economic system. You had masters, owners that owned things and people, and you had workers. It's estimated in that first century Roman Empire. Next slide, please. That first century Roman Empire that probably two-thirds, if not three-quarters of the people were considered slaves. And this included doctors, uh, lawyers. They, they were owned by people. That was the system, and that was a broken system. You see, this brokenness goes back to the beginning. If you go back to Genesis, remember what happened in Genesis in, in the garden? Man and woman were created by God to tend to the garden. Let me just call attention. The tending to the garden, work, became before what? They broke it. We were created to work, to serve God and to serve one another. That, that is at the heart of why we were created. So work is good. Because everything that God created in Genesis, what did he say about it? It is good. Is it in that passage of Scripture in Genesis? I'd invite you to go back and, and read that this week. It's, it's a great account. But then Satan came to the garden and spoke to them and said, did, did God say you couldn't eat of any tree? Oh, and only went. And he said, but if you eat of that tree he told you not to eat of, you'll be like God. Well, there we go, heart of sin, right? Heart of brokenness. So the system that we inherited in work became broken. In fact, it became cursed. He said <clears throat> in Genesis 3, 16 to 19, God said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And that rule is iron fist. See, that's brokenness, broken system, Right? Not the way God created it, that's the way we made it because we broke it. We need to own that we broke it, he didn't. And then in verse 17, he said to the man, because you listen to your wife, and don't go there, men, that doesn't give you a free license to never listen to your wife. That's supposed to be funny, sorry, bad joke. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it, the ground is cursed because of you. The ground is cursed because of you. I'm having technical difficulty. <laughs> there we go. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taking it from it. For you are dust and you will return to dust. Work became what with the fall? Broken, hard, painful. Painful birth pains, painful work. There's a reason you get calluses on your hands when you go and work. So the system is broken. We have a lot of people talking about broken systems today in our, our public discourse, right? But they don't ever go back to the root cause. The root cause is broken humanity. It's the sinfulness of human beings. See, you'll never find solutions to the brokenness in the world in the government and in human effort. It is a supernatural work of God to heal and make the systems right. So this broken system in Rome was slave and master. And so again, God is saying here, all right, how do you live in that system? The system we have now in 21st century America they talk about employees as human resources. You are a can of oil to your employer. If any of you get pink slips around Christmas, it's like, okay, you understand this, don't you? I don't know why companies like to do that, but they do, don't they? They get to the end of the year, they're taking stock of the rest of the year, and then that's when they want to 
But we have been trained and educated as managers and employers to treat people as human resources. Just like you'd use a can of oil or a pile of lumber. That's a broken system, right? You see, as wrong as slavery is, human resource, seeing a human being as anything less than a human being, you see, calling them a resource dehumanizes you, doesn't it? Do you like to be called a resource? No, we want to be valued. But to simply put a dollar figure on what you cost the company and not be seen as a human being is just as broken. It's still what? Slavery. Just with different labels. He speaks to employers here too. And, and here's the broken system about employers. You think you own your company. We have some people in here that own a company, don't we? That you're the owner and not... You see, if you own it, you think you made it. Now don't hear me say you didn't do hard work and create it, but if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are owned by Christ who owns your business and who has given it to you to be a steward. We'll see when we look at the right side up system in Psalm 24, God says the, the earth and everything in it is whose? His. Everyone in here, unless the Lord returns, you're going to die one day and everything you have is somebody else is going to take it and use it. See, we are caretakers. We are, the, the word the Bible uses is steward. A steward is somebody that recognizes they don't own it. They take care of it as if it's theirs. But they recognize they don't own it. You see, again, a broken upside down system, that slave and master system, that human resource system, the idea that you own something instead of simply God places it in your care and asks you to take care of it and grow it and tend to it all the way back to the garden, right? He placed Adam and Eve in the garden to care for it, but they wanted to own it, and so they broke it. The moment we start to see another human being as something to be used up and to give us stuff, we have participated in an upside-down, broken, sinful system. And here's the good news. God calls us to something different, doesn't he? You see these words in Ephesians about how we're to, to work and, and what the right-side-up system is to work unto the Lord, to recognize that, that God is going to give back to us and take care of us, to recognize that the overseer and the employee, the servant, are the same because they belong to the same order. That's a whole different system. That's the first thing I'd call to your attention is we have that one boss. Verses 5 through 9, he says, hey, <laughs> if you go through, and I encourage you, go through that passage and, and circle Christ or Jesus, and, and over and over you'll see that, that what he's saying to them again is serve as you would Christ. Work as if you're working for Jesus. Do God's will from your heart. Do, it, do God's will. You're going to get back from the Lord. Do it as to the Lord. Recognize that both their master and yours is in heaven. This means everybody in the work, when God and we do it the right side up Jesus way, we recognize all of us, whether we're the manager slash owner, right, manager or employee, what you do is worship. You're doing it for Jesus. That's a very different attitude to think about work, isn't it? That what you're doing, you do for Jesus. If you remember when we started this series, I said there's other books in the Bible that speak to this church at Ephesus. I want you to turn for just a moment to 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. Paul wrote this to Timothy, and Timothy was the pastor at Ephesus. Uh, for those listening and for, for you guys here, Temple Baptist Church, you're looking for your next pastor. I'm the interim. And here's some instruction about what it means to be an overseer. Anyone inspires, I'm starting to read in verse 3, 
To be an overseer, he desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own house competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. Those are the qualifications your search team are, are looking at as they look at, uh, for that next person. And, and very good ones. And then he goes on and says deacons, and, and deacon is a word for servant. Another way to read this passage, a valid way to read this passage, is he's giving instruction about what it means to be the manager and the servant within a church. And we're supposed to do everything as we're in the church all the time, whether we're working outside the walls or inside the walls, right? And that's important because here's where some churches, and I'll just speak to this for a moment. One of my roles in them is to, to give some guidance along the way. A lot of churches think the pastor's their employee. And some pastors think that they're the church's boss. That's that broken system that's like, that we just talked about, right? And, and to give some grace, that's the system we participate in, and it's very easy to take a system that is outside God's kingdom and want, because it's what we're used to doing and do what? Bring it inside God's house. Inside God's house, He's the king. He's the Lord. We have one boss, and it's not me. And it's not you. And that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. Except when you want to complain about the boss. He's kind of perfect. If, if we have a complaint, that means the problem's not with him, it's with who? With us, right? That's a good thing. It's an equalizing thing. Because again, we might have different roles because overseer, manager's a role, servant's a role. We're all of equal worth and dignity and value before Jesus. You see, this is a radically different system. And it's a great system God's given us. Hey, we love each other. We love the Lord. And He takes care of us. So He, he calls us to see this worker overseer role. You see, that, that is a very different than slave and master. Owner and human resource, right? Very different system. And he says, okay, we get to live with God as our master even when we're working out in a secular job. I was a young ensign, and uh, I had one of those bosses. You ever have one of those bosses? Overbearing. And, and this was back when, I mean, he was a screamer, literally screamer. Like, make your ears hurt. And did you know that sailors on ships sometimes use bad language? What? <laughs> yeah. And to us that worked for him, the other junior officers, it seemed like he just enjoyed doing that. I think maybe he did. But I told you what my parents instilled in me, my grandparents. I might have a bad boss and some bad circumstances, but my boss is Jesus. And how I kept my attitude adjusted in the midst of a bad situation was okay. I'm doing my best not for him. I'm doing my best work for God. If I can please God, I don't need to worry about what he thinks. Because I've already done the best that I could do. I've been asked that a lot over my life. Is that the best you can do? That's the best I can do for God. So yeah, that's the best I can do. I'm doing my best to please him. Well, I mentioned he kind of liked to break people, and I wouldn't break not because I was better or proud, but because of this attitude. I'm working for God. I'm not working for you. That's, that's liberty, isn't it? To recognize that you're not working for that person. Because you're tempted when you're working for somebody like that not to, to stop trying, right? To not do good. He got brought me into his office, and he's like, I don't get you, Smith. Blah, blah, blah. 
asterisk, asterisk, pound sign. <laughs> you just keep smiling no matter how much stuff I throw at you. Why is that? Again, this was my parents. This isn't pride on my part. I, I actually, I don't know. It was the Lord, Holy Spirit. I just looked at him and said, Engineer, I don't work for you. I work for Jesus. He's a good boss. You would have thought I had punched him right in the nose with all my weight. And I was a little, I, I wasn't as big, heavy as I am now, but I was big and strong still. And he really looked like that. The idea that I, I wasn't working for him, but he was getting better work for me than he would get if I was. And that changed the whole equation. He started treating me like a human being after that. He'd grown up a good Catholic boy. He'd never connected God and work. You know, many of us in here today, you might never have connected God and your work. But God does, doesn't he? This is seeing work right side up. Psalm 24, 1. The earth and everything in it the world and its inhabitants belong to God. They belong to the Lord. Lord means master, owner, creator. We all belong to God. And everything that we say we own, in air quotes, we don't own it, we care for it, right? Belongs to God. So if you're working where you are employed by somebody, we are to work for the Lord. He tells us exactly what spirit-filled, submitted service looks like. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Not in fear and trembling of your master, of your boss, in fear and trembling because you want to bring your best gift to God, don't you? We're supposed to. There's another story back in Genesis. Cain and Abel. If you've grown up in church, or if you haven't, you won't know this story. Cain and Abel were brothers. And one worked in the field and the other worked with livestock. And Abel brought a, a beautiful offering to God. And Cain brought his leftovers to God. It was the way we usually read that. And, and God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain and said, go and do better. And he actually said, sin is crouching at the door. Go and, and do better in return. But instead, Cain went and killed his brother. First murder recorded in the Bible. I've had some bosses I wanted to murder, and I imagine some bosses wanted to murder me from time to time. We hear workplace violence way too often, don't we? That was workplace. Some years ago, I heard a preacher preach on that, and he he asked this question, why did Cain kill Abel? And most of us said, well, he was jealous. Sibling rivalry, we're kind of used to that. And he said, well, maybe. But I, I'll suggest to you, he said, Cain killed Abel because he considered it easier to eliminate the competition than improve his own offering. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart and serve with a good attitude. Wow. You see, your work, this passage in Ephesians, says is an offering to who? To God. Here's a point of application, and we'll ask these questions a little later. As an employee... Is the work you're doing an offering God finds acceptable? If the answer is no, well, here's good news. Confess your sins, repent. God will forgive you, and then he will empower you to do what? To do better and to bring the right offering to the Lord. See, the quality and attitude in your work reflects upon Jesus your boss may not know Jesus. Your fellow employees may not know Jesus. The odds are, with more than two-thirds of the state not joining Jesus, is they don't know Jesus. 
Remember that double gift? He saved you and then he gifted you to show other people Jesus. The way we work matters. He calls us then to have sincere obedience to Jesus. You're not submitting to the boss. And God forbid you're one of those employers that try to make people submit to you. They're not submitting to you. You're submitting to Christ as well. Sincere obedience to Jesus. Heartfelt, diligent work for Jesus. Have a good attitude with Jesus. And now this last section. Verse 7, serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people. Knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them because you know that both their masters and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. No favoritism with God. Our broken human system says the owner is more valuable than the worker. He has the power. She has the power, the owner, over the employee. No, God has the power. God has the ability to give you favor. He calls us to recognize it's God who pays us. It's God who gives us uh, an increase. It's God who graces us. And see, that's a very different economic system, isn't it? This leaves us with some very basic questions to ask. When you think about your work, when you think about your employer, when you think about your employees, what is your attitude? Is your attitude that of Jesus? That sees them as a fellow human being who God loves, who God wants to see saved, who God wants to see blessed, who God wants to see redeemed. It's what Christmas is all about, right? Anybody have a bad attitude at work this week? Seek forgiveness. Ask God to give you what? A new attitude. Ask Him to open your eyes of your heart. There's a few blanks in your bulletin. Think about that. What do you need to confess and repent of this morning in regards to work? Oh, not just work, but that's what we've been looking at in Scripture today. What, what do you need to confess and repent of? Have you thought evil of your employer? Have you given a half-hearted effort? Because they're not treating you right, so why should I give them my full effort? As an employer, as it's Christmas and you're wanting to buy more stuff that will rust and decay and end up being owned by somebody else when you pass away, have you started putting the screws to your employers, to your employees? Mistreating them, treating them as if they owe you something instead of treating them as if you owe God everything. That's, that's what it means to confess, doesn't it? And to repent. And here's the good news of the gospel. We confess and repent and seek forgiveness. What do you need to seek forgiveness for? God is gracious and justice to forgive what? All unrighteousness. You see, God seeks our regular confession and repentance. And he loves to give us forgiveness. But we have to ask. He freely gives it, but he says we have to ask. And just when you think you're powerless to do anything about it, not only will he give us grace and forgiveness, he says, okay, as soon as you confess to me, you can't do this on your own because that system outside, that broken one, keeps pushing in and say. You should be like all the other employers. You should be like all the other employees and give half-hearted efforts. 
and like the other employers and take advantage of your workers and get all you can out of them, use them up like an oil and throw them out and replace them with another one. As soon as you say, I, I, I just, that keeps pushing on me, I can't do anything about it, God reminds you that who, who gives you the power and strength to stand against it and to keep standing against it. It's God himself, his infinite power, his Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit power, the power that raised somebody from the dead so that you and I can have new life. You see, that's the upside right life Jesus calls each and every one of us to. You receive Christ by confessing your sins. By turning to Jesus. It's the ABCs. Turning to Jesus. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who lived, died, was resurrected. And confess Him as Lord. And as we talked about today, Lord means boss. Lord means owner. He owns you and everything you have. The earth is the Lord and all who inhabits it. Friend, Jesus invites you today to confess, repent, be forgiven, and be given a new life that's full of his power. Will you accept him today? As a believer, will you confess your sins of the past few weeks and ask for forgiveness and be filled with the Spirit, the Spirit-filled life? Pray with me. Would you stand if you're able? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you love and care for us, how you indeed have given us and opened the eyes of our hearts to see how to live in a broken, messed up world in spite of it, not because of it. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would bring repentance, confession to the minds of every heart that, that's listening this morning to move us to, to speak to you and ask and receive the forgiveness that you give. The greatest gift of Christmas is that new life in Christ. Lord, may your spirit move us, break us, make us new. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Altar's open to pray. I'm here if you want to pray with me. If anybody wants to know more, about receiving Jesus Christ. Ask me or, or talk to us or any of the deacons or leaders after the service. Come as God leads. You called me out upon the waters, the great unknown, freed me.
Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your Keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul rests in your embrace I am yours You are mine Oh, oh, oh. God, we just thank you so much for all you've done for us, God, for your many blessings in our life. Sometimes the, the very things that bring us pain are the doors that we need to walk through for healing. And we don't want to walk through those doors. No one does. No one wants to willingly walk through pain. God, sometimes you allow it, but then you give us the grace to do it. So, God, thank you. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you that in the midst of times of trouble, when the oceans rise and it feels like we're sinking, somehow, God, you got us by the hand. And you're leading us and guiding us. Just like the old footprints said, I only saw one set of footprints, and I looked up and you were carrying me. God, I pray that you would carry us through all the difficulty through life. And God, I pray that you'd bless everyone as they go um, throughout their week this week. And as we enjoy this Christmas season, this holiday season, God, would we really just take advantage of it and, and have a heart of gratefulness everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you're just.